Another even higher level service is what's called Channel I.O. Channel I.O. is similar in many ways to direct memory access, but it actually has hardware uh, that allows all of the uh, kind of loading of the controllers to take place without involving the CPU almost at all. Uh, this allows the CPU to continue on with work almost completely uninterrupted until the process is complete. Uh, Channel I.O. provides a buffer where data can be used uh, to, to move information from the I.O. device to memory. Uh, it provides the necessary registers and controllers that would be used to perform and initiate the direct memory transfer. Uh, so that step we were talking about when we talked about direct memory access where the CPU would stop every block and then load up the I.O. controller with what it needed, that can be done with the channel I.O. controller without involving the CPU. Uh, this allows all of this to happen pretty much, again, without the, the CPU being involved at all. There might be an initial usage of the CPU to set up the channel I.O. transfer, and then all of the blocks that need to be transferred can be taken place, and then the CPU will only be notified when it's complete. This would signify that, say, your entire program has been loaded from secondary storage into primary storage and it's ready to be run. Now, where is this actually used? This is commonly used on mainframe computers such as IBM System Z. Uh, many other dedicated server systems uh, such as Oracle's or Sparks can have something similar, uh, but this is not commonly found in commodity level hardware. Uh, or servers. So, you know, something like a server farm that is full of commodity level hardware is probably not using channel architecture, nor is your desktop or laptop. This is uh, dedicated hardware that uh, is very expensive to build. However, it is very, very fast. Remember that I.O. is uh, our biggest bottleneck. And if we can uh, implement a system that basically takes the CPU out of dealing with I.O. at all, we've given ourselves a huge optimization on how fast we can actually process. So uh, an IBM mainframe, for example, can commonly, and I've seen this myself, uh, run the equivalent on, say, 8 or 10 CPUs of what another server might run on 64 or 100. And the reason why it can do that is not because these CPUs are mammothly more powerful. They're usually maybe a gigahertz or two faster than your standard CPU. But in the grand scheme of things, we're not talking about a doubling, quadrupling, or, or greater. We're talking about, yes, they, they have a speed advantage. But where they really shine in these machines is in how they deal with I.O. They also shine in how much cash they have. Um, they can have gigabits of cash, um, but that's a, another topic for another day. So the combination of these things, though, means that I.O. gets done very, very fast, and it leaves the CPU out. Now, a channel system is actually divided into separate what are called sub-channels. These are areas where we have specialized hardware that knows how to deal with specialized device controllers. So, for example, our network connections are one example of this. You might have a channel subsystem that knows specifically how to deal with different types of network or fiber connections in the most efficient manner. This might be a separate subsystem from the one that deals with, say, localized disks. These subsystems give you even more speed advantages. And in breaking it down in this hierarchical system, you can see that the CPU and memory are only dealing with minor conversations with the channel subsystem, which is then dealing with each control unit that deals with its individual devices. This separation ensures that the CPU is happily uh, running whatever program you're hoping it is, and all of the I.O. is being taken care of under the covers for it, so that hopefully it's prepared and ready uh, when the CPU needs to use it. 